You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Coming up... It's Budget Week, where Chancellors announce their exciting plans for taxation and public spending. But how does Parliament get to grips? Indeed, does it get to grips with the nation's finances? We talked to Conservative peer Nicky Morgan, who's been both a Treasury Minister and a scrutineer on the Treasury Committee. More dreadful polls for the Conservatives, some of them outright catastrophic. So what would the House of Commons look like if the Conservatives fell below 20% at the next election? And the exodus continues. Paul Scully MP joins the band of senior Conservative MPs planning to leave at the election, leaving some choice words about the future of his party ringing in his colleague's ear and a 16-part Twitter thread talking about the brutality of politics and the toll it takes on politicians and their families. But first, Ruth, I suppose inevitably we've got to talk about the budget. It's always one of the big events on the parliamentary calendar. There's all sorts of theatre that goes on. The Chancellor raising his red box in front of number 11 for the photographers to take the traditional picture. What's the Chancellor going to have to drink at the dispatch box? Is it going to be water or is he going to default back to the good old days when they could have alcohol? But this is supposed to be the moment when the government unveils its plans for the management of the economy, for the levels of tax, for the levels of spend, for the coming year. And this time the unveiling was pretty perfunctory because the veil had been ripped away some some days before in the national press. Yeah, I mean, there were days when um, Chancellor of the Exchequer used to resign, having leaked just a sentence of the budget. This year we got pretty much most of the proposals on the front pages of the national newspapers. And interestingly, the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker, neither of them took the government to task for this. Yeah, it was remarkable. I I think that that's goes back to the weakened state of Mr Speaker Hoyle these days in in the wake of that long-running row about the SNP opposition debate and his choice of an extra amendment there. Maybe he's a bit too bruised, but in past years there have been rebukes issued Mm. from the chair for leaking of announcements, and this was so comprehensively leaked that you wonder what the point of having a a long budget statement was in the end. There really wasn't that much. In fact, there was practically nothing to surprise anybody. No rabbits were plucked from the hat. Everyone Mm. was waiting till the last moment to see if some exciting announcement would suddenly be conjured up to wrong-foot Sir Keir Starmer, who has the job as leader of the opposition in replying to a budget for reasons lost in the midst of time. (laughs) Uh, But no wrong-footing for Sir Keir Starmer. This must be one of the easiest replies to a budget statement that any leader of the opposition's had to do in the last 40 years. Yeah, but it actually was the SNP that brought the real, the only bit of theatre really (laughs) at the budget statement when they suddenly pushed for a vision on the, uh, the the first motion that yeah. the House considers after the budget statement. And normally it's a perfunctory goes through on the nod. I can't remember a division. It's the, the provisional the collection of taxes motion, isn't it? Which means, in effect, that the, the new taxes that the Chancellor has just announced, things like duty on, on beers, wines and spirits or whatever, take effect pretty much immediately. And that, as you say, is a normal part of the budget ritual. It happens on the nod. Everybody gets on with it. And this time the SNP, I think partly to demonstrate their continuing irritation yeah. at the way they were treated a couple of weeks ago, decided to force a division. Yeah. The other um, unusual bit was that we had two quite outspoken responses to the budget against what Jeremy Hunt was proposing, but from Conservatives' own MPs, including a minister. So Douglas Ross, the leader of the party in Scotland, and Andrew Bowie, a minister, both speaking out against the proposals in relation to... This this is a continuation of the energy windfall levy, which is an an extra tax slapped on the energy producers as a result of the vast rise in energy prices for imported gas as a result of Putin's war. And this is something the Scottish Tories have said is flatly a bad idea. Douglas Ross, as Scottish Tory leader, apparently had a public argument with the Chancellor at one point. And the SNP, of course, is making great play of the fact that the Scottish Tories always used to trade on this idea that they had a lot of leverage over the government because they, they were so important in t- 
Theresa May's days at least, to the government's majority. The SNP is now able to say, tee hee, look at them, they can't make the government change on anything, even something they did, they conceive of as a very bad idea for Scotland. And there's been more kickback on a, another aspect of the budget, which is that the chair of the Defence Select Committee, Jeremy Quinn, is not happy at all, and he's written to the Chancellor demanding a meeting. Quite an interesting situation, this. The Defence Secretary Grant Shapps said in a fairly recent speech that he thought the country was, had moved from a post-war situation to a pre-war situation. In other words, we might be ramping up to some kind of conflict with Russia. And that kind of implied to most people that the government was going to bring forward a big increase in defence spending. And that certainly hasn't happened in this budget. Indeed, the, the budget appears to cut headline defence spending and headline investment in defence. Now, there, there's some dispute around whether or not everything's been counted in this. Does this count aid to Ukraine and things like that? But all the same, it's hardly a giant increase. And Jeremy Quinn, who's written, I think he actually wants to see Grant Shapps, but he would be perfectly happy to have the Chancellor as well, I'm sure. Uh, Jeremy Quinn, who speaks with the authority of being a fairly recent Minister for Defence Procurement. He was in the MOD for really quite a long time. He's now chairing the Defence Select Committee, and I think that just underlines the depth of backbench conservative concern mm. about the state of the national defences, because the Army, Navy and Air Force have all been run down to quite a low level compared to their former glories. Yep. So what happens now in terms of Parliament? We've got four days of debate on the budget. We'll then have a votes at the end of that next week. Um, uh, and on Wednesday there will be a bill that will be ran through probably in a single day which will deal with the further 2p cut in national insurance which was the centrepiece really of Jeremy Hunt's offering this week. Yeah and then uh, there'll have to be another piece of legislation which will be the finance bill which will give legal cover, legal effect to all these other proposals mm. in the, the, the statement. And there's a, a different kind of complaint ab about the nature of the finance bill which suggests that the way the government is kind of structuring the finance bill narrows down MPs' ability to propose changes to it. And it all centres around a very techie-sounding provision called the Amendment to the Law Resolution, which used to accompany budgets and is now not seen so often. Yes, this is where we're getting really into the, uh, the nerdy weeds of parliamentary procedure. But it does matter because it is about backbenchers' rights and abilities to amend the budget. Now, first thing is to say that MPs who are not ministers can't increase a tax or extend the purpose of a tax. But what they can do is reduce a tax rate or enhance relief, tax relief. But in order to do that, they've got to be able to amend what's called the first ways and means motion that's tabled after the Chancellor's budget statement. Now, the scope for amendment of the subsequent finance bill is determined by the scope of this motion that's tabled by the Chancellor. And historically what's happened is that these motions are tabled, as you, as you say, called amendment of the law motions. And these are broadly drawn in scope. So essentially it's expedient for MPs to amend the law with respect to the national debt, public revenue, further provision in connection with finance. It's all pretty broad financial terms. So, it, 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 And if you've got that wording, then the sky's the limit and the kind of changes you can propose. Yeah, but what's happened, importantly, and it's a, a change that... The government brought in itself, it's been doing it since 2017 in successive budgets, it's done it without any consultation, is they've introduced the first ways and means motion tabled after the Chancellor's statement, not as this broadly drawn motion, but as a much more narrowly drawn one, which deals simply with income tax, which means that the scope of an amendment that an MP can table it has to be about income tax, it can't be about anything else. So that clearly narrows down the opportunities that MPs have to offer suggestions, to come up with ideas. Now, this is techie procedural stuff, but it basically means that the backbenchers have got much less opportunity in what is already a pretty limited arena for them to operate than they otherwise would have. And there have been complaints about this from one of the Commons' most hardened street fighters, David Davis, briefly Brexit secretary a few years back, but essentially someone who's, who's lurked shark-like on the back benches, pouncing on various causes, and has been a very, very effective operator. And he's seen the technical issues around this, and he's raised it in, in a letter to the Chancellor. Yeah, I mean, I suspect the Chancellor was sort of, you know, meh, who cares, you know, yeah. shrug, and uh, probably won't be around for the next budget to deal with it. 
but essentially David Davis is sort of taking up the cudgels to defend backbenchers rights and he's saying to Jeremy Hunt you've shut down the rights the house has enjoyed for more than 100 years and he makes the important historic point that you know budgets and finance bills were the reason for having a parliament to approve the expenditure of the executive to exercise some control over government over the crown of course historically in those days and he says I urge you to restore these historic rights for members. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> so, Mark, we're going to pop along to Westminster to talk to Nikki Morgan, Baroness Morgan, who's a former Treasury Minister herself, but also scrutineer on the Treasury Committee, see what she's got to say. Yeah, plenty indeed to explore with her about how Parliament does fit in to the scrutiny of the money. <laughs> Well, to get an insider's view of how budgets are made and then how they're pushed through Parliament, we've come to the House of Lords to meet Nikki Morgan, Baroness Morgan of Coates, former Treasury Minister. You were Economic Secretary to the Treasury, you were then Financial Secretary to the Treasury, and in a later incarnation, you were Chair of the Treasury Select Committee. So you've seen budgets being made and you've seen budgets being fed through Parliament. So I guess our, our, our opening question really is... How much traction does Parliament really have over this whole process? Well, I think obviously the fact that the budget has to be presented to Parliament and it is a key moment of the parliamentary year. And uh, of course, the Finance Act eventually has to go through Parliament in terms of setting of of tax rates. But the reality is, look, I think chancellors will often involve their parliamentary party colleagues, at least in a nominal way, by appearing to ask for their suggestions. Of course... Appearing? uh, Well, uh, they, they, they will hold a meeting, they will ask for suggestions. How many of those suggestions actually appear in the budget is always a bit of a guessing game. I mean, George Osborne started this, certainly as far as I was concerned, which is, um, can you spot the constituency or the MP that is in favour in the budget speech? Because often you'll get people literally named, so-and-so has suggested this measure, or I'm delighted to announce this funding for this statue in so-and-so's constituency. I, I think it was about, what was it, the RAF station that was preserved in Uxbridge, so that Boris Johnson had to say thank you when he was Uxbridge MP. <laughs> of course, the big role for Parliament is the Treasury Select Committee's role post-budget in scrutinising the contents and, and why things have been announced. How effective is that? I mean, as Treasury Select Committee Chair, did you feel that you had the time, the resources, the information at your disposal to really do an effective job? Well, I guess, I mean, it's part of a wider issue, which is, does Parliament have the resources and the capability to hold government to account? And of course, we're always at a slight disadvantage because we haven't got the civil service. We haven't had all the the inputs. But I think overall, actually, I think it's one of the things that the Select Committee system does really well and the Treasury Select Committee does very well. We have great members of staff and, uh, and also because we were able to call for evidence, not just from the Chancellor, but also from people like uh, think tanks like the uh, the IFS, but also the uh, Resolution Foundation, the Women's Budget Group as well, other academics. We get the OBR in, the Office of Budget Responsibility. And that's actually really, really interesting to hear both from the OBR. We always used to start with the question, have you had any influence in any way on the judgments that you've made in, in your report? To which the answer is certainly so far has always been no. So hearing from them and then hearing from the Chancellor One of my memories is that uh, Philip Hammond sat down in one of our sessions and said, I'm very busy, how long am I going to be here? And I thought, well, you're going to be here a lot longer now you said that. (laughs) (laughs) And the fact is that we are able to keep ministers in front of the select committee, much to the upset of the officials, as long as we need them to be there to answer the questions. And of course, in a select committee, you can keep asking the same question. And I had a great band of select committee members, and we would find different ways to ask the same question until we got to some sort of an answer. Are there examples of those Treasury Committee hearings actually changing anything or getting an unexpected explanation out of, out of a, a minister of why there's a particular feature of the budget? I think not, perhaps not from the minister themselves, but from the OBR, they will often perhaps highlight something that might have been missed in the commentary, and perhaps also from the think tanks and other commentariat, if you like, around the budget, who would come in and point out something to us that perhaps gets missed. It's not a headline feature, but a, a 
chart, a distributional analysis, the reality of whether money is actually going to be raised. And often, you know, one of the numbers that does a lot of heavy lifting in budgets is how much HMRC are going to raise when they crack down on tax avoidance. And then often people come in and say, this is a figure that's never going to be achieved. And so I, I can't say we generated headlines, but I think those in the know definitely look at the sessions and think, is there any more that we can follow up on? There is this sense of unreality sometimes about budgets that the whole thing is predicated on a whole load of forecasts which we know can be seriously derailed by events which we know are very seldom completely accurate. So you you make a, a set of tax cuts predicated on getting so much growth and getting so much in taxes and having to pay so much for your borrowing and none of those figures may come true in the end and so th- th- there is this weird sense of shadow boxing about it all. Yes and I think perhaps that's become more so. I mean I think that the, the first thing to say is because we have the forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility that's something we didn't have probably what 15 years ago and I think that's the same with anybody. You could say the same about the Bank of England making decisions about interest rates. They're very reliant on, on their forecasts and other people's forecasts. But I think particularly at the moment, perhaps particularly in an election atmosphere, there is definitely a sense of sort of shadow boxing, I think, here in Parliament, which is actually decisions and things are being announced when actually we all know that perhaps in a couple of years' time it could look very different. What I'm working around to here is the idea that you have unaffordable tax cuts predicated on undeliverable public expenditure reductions, not to mention the annual crackdown on on tax evasion that's announced by every chancellor every year. Yes, and I think probably where this comes out, obviously, ultimately is going to be, uh, I think, in the election campaign itself, and that that point will be made repeatedly, I'm sure, about both sides, uh, spending plans and, and, and tax plans. But of course, I mean, it goes back to how is the budget and how is the Treasury held accountable by Parliament, you know, both by the select committees, but also in terms of questions to the Chancellor and everything else. And I think also just the public, the sort of sense eventually they'll see that actually what was said a couple of years ago isn't manifestly true. And you'll have to look at the whole way in which the Office of Budget Responsibility does its forecasts. Could things be more effective if... For example, the Treasury Committee had either a subcommittee or there was an alternative committee looking at specifically the budget or taxation. Because the feeling is that the Treasury Committee is quite stretched in terms of the sort of the political and policy landscape it's got to look at. Just from your perspective, having been a chair of that committee, do you think there's any benefits to that? Well, I think often setting up a subcommittee for a specific purpose is a very good idea. And particularly when, I suppose, you might get a sense that something is unfolding or going to unfold that needs careful monitoring. And of course, another example of that has been around the scrutiny of financial services legislation post-Brexit, where obviously the, the Treasury is now much more in the driving seat rather than the EU. I mean, of course, one of the things for select committees is the challenge of both launching new inquiries, but also returning to existing issues. And I suppose in a way, because the budgets and fiscal events do come round, you know, they seem to come round every couple of months now, there is the opportunity to keep returning and to keep looking at what happened in terms of the forecasts. And you know, that's partly obviously about why the members of a select committee are so important in terms of the quality of the scrutiny that they give, the question they ask. And look, the staffing as well. I mean, nobody ever has quite enough resources, but I would argue that resourcing of select committees is a phenomenally important job for Parliament to get right. And was there ever any discussion in your time about something like a parliamentary budget office, for example, that other Westminster-style parliaments, Canada or Australia, for example, have? Yeah, there was discussion. It has been put forward. I mean, it would be helpful. Obviously, we have, you know, whether it would be an extension of something like, it's a bit more than the library, but that way where you've got people who really know the detail of things, perhaps there are former select committee uh, staff members, others. Of course, select committees can appoint expert advisors for particular inquiries, and it may well be that's something that they wanted to do. But, you know, I think actually as these areas become more and more important, as I think the role of select committees becomes more important, as I think there's a sense sometimes that actually governments of all persuasions aren't terribly keen about being held to account by parliament i think that is an issue that will probably have its time talk us through the kind of the upstream process for making the budget decisions i mean there's already been some blowback about some of the things the chance has announced about the uh, energy windfall tax for example about the level of defense spending how much consultation in advance is there with the relevant cabinet ministers or are they just sort of handed the parcel money and there you've got to make do with that 
Well, there's an element of both, I suppose. I mean, I think it depends on whether the departmental minister, particularly, I suppose, the Secretary of State, is calling for something to be changed or to be invested in, in which case there's quite a lot of lobbying, uh, including particularly with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, and you have those meetings. But equally, I guess, if sometimes there is a change that the Chancellor decides to make and um, they know it's not going to go down very well in the department, you can often find that actually you get told. I mean, I do remember getting a call from George Osborne the night before one budget about the impending sugar tax, for example. But otherwise, typically, you don't see the whole thing stitched together until the cabinet meeting that happens the morning of the budget, by which point, of course, the document's been published, the speech has been written, and then you have to work out whether you can launch a bit of a rearguard action. And I might add the Sunday Times exclusive on the contents of the budget is a couple of days old. Well, I think that is extraordinary. I mean, look, I think this year, quite how the 2P cut in national insurance got to be front page of a newspaper the day before Was it a leak? Was it a well-timed guess? Was it a briefing? I don't know. But I suspect that actually the House of Commons is pretty unimpressed. And I I think what that made us all think, in a way, was that there was another rabbit out of the hat, and it turned out that there wasn't. What we're talking about is actually quite a serious democratic deficit, because you've just said cabinet ministers sort of see it in the round the morning that it's announced. Parliament doesn't have that much control over it. So essentially, it's been decided at the centre by the Chancellor, by the Prime Minister. That's quite a serious problem, given the amount of money that we're talking about that's both being raised through taxation and, and through expenditure by the departments. Well, it is in one way, in the sense that, I mean, I guess the Treasury, and that's, that's more typical, I suppose, of the way the Treasury conducts business on a, on a more general basis, actually, is, again, having been a, a spending department minister, you will often find that you're arguing the case with Treasury officials who think they know better how to spend the money in your department than you do. And I think that is also to the upset of the officials in the, in the relevant department as well. But having said that, of course, and we talked about the coverage, because often what happens with a budget, you know, it's great announcements on day one, and then you've got to worry about the day two, the day three coverage. Look, I have experience of, you know, we wanted all schools to be academies. We announced that in 2016. Actually, the parliamentary party were not keen, didn't want to see it. And it was one of those things that a few weeks later we had to row back from. So I guess in terms of accountability, it happens in a number of ways. Is there a sense that there's almost an inverse relationship that the better the headlines on the day, the the worse the budget unravels later on. Well, there's always that real worry, isn't there? I mean, I remember when I was in the uh, in the Treasury, you, know, you have, as you say, hopefully positive headlines, hopefully support, you know, the morning after. And then I think that probably what you hope is that the news agenda is going to move on very, very quickly. Everybody's focus moves elsewhere. I mean, I think I think there are many people in the Conservative Party who are still very scarred by the pasty tax <laughs> and the caravan tax. I mean, that, that's one of the things that's often struck me about. I mean, years ago, covering local government, you used to see this as a Leicestershire County Council, they'd wave through a billion pounds of public spending and then have a five-hour argument about the paperclip budget. And I think there's something not dissimilar happens in, in the Commons. They, they can't really get their teeth into the grand strategy of a budget. So they they sink what remaining teeth they have into stuff on the edge, as you say, the pasty tax, the caravan tax. Look, I think that's one of the dangers sometimes with Parliament generally, isn't it, is that often we will, particularly as backbench MPs, focus partly because that is the response that we are seeing in inboxes. People will obviously uh, marshal their resources from outside to criticise something and it's easier to criticise a specific measure or to marshal forces against it and to say, you know, this has got to be reversed, this has got to be stopped than to attack, I suppose, the whole grand strategy. And of course, what you do is you get a grounds of opinion, potentially you get people starting to sign online petitions and all that sort of thing, and it grows from there. We talked only about the House of Commons, because of course the House of Lords has a very limited role. Its role is to basically agree with what what the Commons wants on financial matters. You've now seen this debate from all sides. You're now in the House of Lords. Do you think there's more that could be done? I mean, the the peers have more time. They haven't got constituency, so they haven't got those kinds of constituency pressures. Is there more that they could do, for example, strategically to look at some of these questions in a way that wouldn't interfere with the primacy of the Commons on, on financial matters? 
it's, a, it's quite a delicate re- a relationship between the two houses on this. It's a very delicate relationship. Firstly, I, I guess MPs would perhaps feel pretty uncertain if uh, the Lord started saying more, particularly on specific measures. We are going to have a general debate on the budget, and I do think that one of the things that we probably don't appreciate sufficiently is that the resources, the insight, the expertise that sits in the House of Lords chamber in terms of former chancellors, but, you know, former economists, former academics, and people, of course, who've been at the front line in terms of of spending. We do have the Lords Economic Affairs Committee, and they do a fantastic job. They probably do, in many ways, look at the, the bigger themes, actually, rather than looking at individual spending measures. I guess it's partly tied up with with House of Lords reform uh, as well. I suppose the ironic point would be Treasury officials are never keen on their ministers coming before House of Commons select committees. Can you imagine if they had to spend more time answering questions of the House of Lords as well on finance matters? Just just a final thought, really. Um, Do you think that this budget has moved the dial at all in terms of public opinion? Or might there be a further mini-budget or fiscal event yet to come before the country finally gets to vote in the general election? (laughs) Well, I suppose the answer to that is, if we knew when the general election was, we we would be able to to answer that confidently. I I suspect there is more to come. If you think the election is going to be in the autumn, there'll be a bit of time perhaps for another mini-fiscal event before that unfolds. Is it going to change things? Probably not. Because people, I think, national insurance, which is the big measure, is one of those things that people don't necessarily understand anyway. I think the childcare changes, actually, childcare benefit, are probably of more immediate relevance for for the relevant households. But I guess the measure is not just about does it change things, but does it make things any worse in the sense that, going back to what we were saying about what the Chancellor does not want to do is to make life more difficult for the government. And I think on that measure, he's probably been successful. Nikki Morgan, thanks very much for joining us on the pod. Thank you for having me. If you're enjoying the pod and think like Mark and I do that Parliament matters, why not join the Hansard Society? This year we celebrate our 80th anniversary and throughout the year we'll have a number of special events to mark this important milestone. For as little as a cup of coffee each month, you can join us and follow in the footsteps of our first members, Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee. And if you're enjoying the issues that we're talking about on the pod, you'll also be getting our special members-only Dispatch Box newsletter each week, where we bring together the best news and stories about parliaments here in the UK and around the world. You can join by going to hansardsociety.org.uk slash membership. So we'll be back again in a few minutes to talk about the budget again with Professor Henry Midgley, who used to work at the National Audit Office and the House of Commons to talk about how the Parliament's control of the budget and spending plans could be improved. But in the meantime, we thought we'd take a short budget break and discuss Rwanda. Yes, the government's bill to allow migrants to be removed to Rwanda is in its final stages now in the House of Lords. Peers have had quite a lot of fun in the last week rewriting large chunks of it. They passed 10 amendments that were resisted by the government on issues like removing limitations on the ability of courts and tribunals to consider someone's removal to Rwanda, looking at whether or not you can challenge, as a matter of fact, that Rwanda is safe in courts and tribunals. The government took quite a battering, lost a whole series of votes, often by quite impressive margins in the House of Lords at what's called report stage. But that's not the end of things, because the bill will have a quick third reading stage in the coming weeks, and then it'll be sent off to the House of Commons for what's known as parliamentary ping-pong, where the changes to the bills have to be agreed by both houses, and the government will doubtless use its majority in the House of Commons to strike down all those ten changes that have been made and send the bill back to noble lords. What struck me, Mark, about the 10 votes that the government lost. Now, bear in mind, the Conservatives have got 271 peers in the House. And these majorities were quite large, sort of sometimes 100 votes between them. And at no point did the Conservatives manage to muster more than 189 peers in their own lobby. Basically, the Conservatives didn't get their troops out fully. Now, was that because actually quite a number of Conservatives just didn't want to to turn up you know sort of it's almost a form of abstention yeah or did the government just not try they're quite content for these amendments to go through with with big majorities against them and and you know say to the commons look this is a dreadful house of lords you know trying to be difficult and 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 come up with all these changes to our bill and we're just going to block them and the second element of the the discussion i think that struck me was labor's positioning on this yeah i mean two strands to it there's all the politics of immigration and labor not wanting to take a stance which can be used against it never 
evidence in the coming general election. But Labour are also looking at the very real prospect of being in government. And the one thing they really, really don't want is to have the House of Lords doing to them what it's doing to the current government. They don't want its legislation struck down. They don't want to set a precedent that an elected government can have its legislation butchered on a regular basis in the House of Lords. Now, what's happening here is, is not that that legislation is being destroyed. The Lords are proposing amendments. The Commons will strike them down. The Lords may then say, well, well let's insist on a few watered-down versions of those amendments and try again, see if we can swing the opinion of the Commons. But after a few go-rounds, what normally happens on these occasions is that the House of Lords gracefully backs down and it can happen by a process almost of erosion that some people say well look we've tried the elected House wants this bill we tried to suggest to them that it should be different they're not prepared to listen how much longer are we going to go on round and round trying again and again to get the same result mm. I mean, it was interesting in the debate Lord Hodgson the Conservative peer said that the Lord's role here is to wound not to kill and then there was a sort of a, a discussion I mean it's actually Lord Deben the Conservative to appear formerly, I think it was John yeah, Gummer. The artist formerly known as John Selwyn Gummer, yeah. Yeah, and, and he was making the case, he's, he was supporting the amendments against his own government's position. He was making the argument that the opposition wasn't really performing its function because its role was to stand up on these issues and to perform the Lord's revising function. But the Labour position, I mean... <laughs> The question is, how how long is ping pong going to go on for? Yeah. The Labour Party has kind of indicated that they're content for the government to get its bill broadly before Easter, which would suggest it's not going to go through many rounds of ping pong, perhaps two, maybe yeah. three, if, if that. There are some in the House, and indeed outside the House, I mean, an argument being advocated by people like Sunder Katwala from the Think Tank British Futures, is saying Labour's got a good hand here. It could stand up for the rule of law. It could stand up for, you know, the humanitarian principles and say, yes, the government can have its bill, but we want some of these amendments through. And if you are going to object and stand in the way, you're not even going to consider the amendments, then we're going to spin it out for a longer period of time. So the government, you put into the government's hands, you know, you can get it through quicker, but you're going to have to make some concessions. If you don't make concessions, then it's going to take a lot longer. And one of the the concerns I think some of the, the peers were expressing in the debate this week was that Labour doesn't really seem to be prepared to use that hand. There was certainly quite a lot of irritation at the thought that the government isn't listening and it's just waiting for the moment when it can overturn all these amendments and tell these bothersome peers where to get off. And the House of Lords doesn't like that. The House of Lords takes itself seriously and expects the government to take it seriously. And the awful suspicion lurks that the government actually doesn't take it all that seriously and just sees it as a problem to be managed. But at the same time, there are issues here. It's absolutely extraordinary that you you have to put down an amendment saying, and this bill must be consistent with the principle of the rule of law, domestic and international law. That's an extraordinary thing to even have to say. And then you've got the whole issue of whether or not it is proper for the government to just assert as a matter of law Rwanda is safe. I keep coming back to the wonderful quote from um, former law officer Edward Garnier, who's a conservative peer, saying that it's the legislative equivalent of declaring all dogs to be cats. Mm. It's not what Parliament should be doing, in his view. And so the, there are a couple of really good sticking points there where they could actually have quite a sort of glamorous last stand, mm. Mm. F- at least for a while. But then the politics are... Uh, perhaps takes over the politics of what might be said in a general election campaign, the politics of what might then start to happen to Labour legislation if there's a Labour government after that election. Mm. But if you accept that the Lord's role is not to to block and to reject, that it's a revising chamber, its job is to put forward proposals to improve, to amend, to adjust. As Lord Coker, the Labour peer leading on the bill, made the point, the government's role vis-a-vis the Lord's is to listen and to engage and to consider amendments. And as Lord Kerr of Kinloch, the former FCO official, I think, said, it seems like the government's position on the bill is that there's nothing that the Lords have suggested that they would consider. There's nothing that they're prepared to amend. There's nothing that they're prepared to adjust. There's nothing that they think the Lords have said that is worthy of of, of revision. And therefore, is actually the government breaching its constitutional relationship with the Lords by not really engaging in a constructive way? And if that's the case, then is Labour of the opposition right to almost go along with it? But there is an interesting side issue to all this, which is that the convener of the crossbenches, Lord Kinnell, has been putting together a paper about what the Lords should and shouldn't interfere with what comes under the so-called Salisbury Convention, where the key manifesto commitments of an elected government are immune from being 
scrapped or wrecked by the House of Lords. And he's, he's kind of widening that a bit. And, and it, the argument seems to be, and I'm paraphrasing him wildly here, that, that if something's within the kind of general thrust of a government's offer to the electorate, then the Lords shouldn't get in the way of it. And so while there wasn't a Rwanda bill specifically mentioned in the government's manifesto back in 2019, the Rwanda policy is broadly consistent with what the government said it was going to try and do, and therefore peers shouldn't get in the way of it. Now, that's interesting both because it's a, a considerable widening of an important mm. constitutional doctrine, and also because you, you, you kind of think to yourself that maybe a Labour government coming in might quite like that, might like the little bit of extra room for manoeuvre that it would get mm. from that. Because, of course, it's entirely possible that the Labour manifesto for the next general election might include a, a pledge to scrap or seriously reform the Rwanda scheme, at which point, under those rules, their lordships couldn't really interfere with that and it would go straight through. And it's also of a piece with the fact that party manifestos, whilst they've got bigger and bigger, are actually got vaguer and vaguer. I mean, you know, you, you haven't got this... In, in a lot of manifestos, you don't have that kind of specificity. Mm. And I think it potentially it is helpful, and it may well be why Lord Canool is, is engaging with this, uh, you know, ahead of the election, to try and sort of set out the parameters and find where there is a consensus. And it also gets the, Labour off that hook of not yeah, having to appoint hundreds of yeah. peers to make sure its will is done in the House of Lords. Because it's seems to me that the only alternative to appointing that number of peers is to have some kind of deal, whether that's a formal or an informal agreement about how they're going to operate so that a Labour government with a you know pretty good majority in the House of Commons, if that's what is going to happen, as the opinion polls suggest, can't be blocked by unelected Conservative peers in, in the House of Lords. I'm looking forward to a Smith-True convention. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But the other thing is also a convention exists when all the parties accept you know, if you like, the rules of the game, how whatever the convention is about should operate. It's pretty clear now that actually the convention about manifesto commitments perhaps isn't universally accepted and that the, the parameters, the grounds for it, there are different views in the in the House of Lords and therefore actually perhaps we do need a restatement or a, a development of a new convention to clarify things. And I think after the next general election, my first act may be to get my constitutional anorak dry cleaned, ready for the next <laughs> exciting episode of this. And talking of after the next election, there have been some absolutely fascinating for Conservatives, horrifying opinion polls out there. Consistently, uh, there have been two or three polls showing the Conservatives in the 20% area, less than half the Labour vote. In one poll, I think there were 47% yeah. with the Conservatives on 20, 20 and the Lib Dems on 9 and the Greens and Reform both on 8, just behind the Lib Dems. And the projections of what a Parliament would look like if that were to actually happen in a general election have the Conservatives down to third party status, 27 seats to the Lib Dems having 47 or 48, I think. Gosh. Well, we've had a bit of fun with this. Um, because I mean, Just a bit of fun. Just, just, a, bit just of fun, a bit of fun, as, as the great Peter Snow would say. I, I, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced that the, the, the debacle will be this bad for the Conservatives, but this is Ipsos Mori, an established pollster, saying that this is the, the lowest percentage share of the vote that's ever been recorded in their poll for the Conservative Party since they started polling in 1978. So let's take it as it is and, and assume that this might be the result. Where does that leave the House of Commons? As you say, it would be astonishing. The Conservative Party would become, the, from the party of government, the third party. What does that mean? But it also means that collectively the opposition benches would consist of not much more than 100 MPs. So the Liberal Democrats with 48 seats would be the official opposition to the government. I imagine you'd have Labour MPs having to sit round onto the opposition side because there'd just be so many of them. They couldn't all possibly fit in on the government side, you know, even if they were jammed there sort of buttock to buttock. So you'd have the Lib Dems as the second party, the official leader of the opposition with all the perquisites that involved, Ed Davey residing in the leader of the opposition's <laughs> rather splendid office behind the Speaker's chair, and the Conservative leader, whoever it might be at that point, consigned to some sort of modest office suite in uh, Port Cullis House, perhaps. And that's before you get on to the fact that it would be the Lib Dems who had opposition day debates, and the Conservatives as the third party would have three days of debates available to them that have to share some of that with the smaller parties, the SNP, the Democratic Unionists and so forth. You'd have combined Liberal Democrats and Conservative MPs, about 72 MPs. Now think about what that 72 MPs are going to have to do. They're going to have to provide front bench opposition for all the government departments. They're going to have to provide members of select committees. 
the Liberal Democrats would get a few chairs of select committees. One or two, I think. Yeah. It would, um, possibly three. So, but, um, and and pl- some are dedicated, of course, to the op- main opposition party. So chair of public accounts committee, for example. You're going to have to staff those. They're going to have to have enough members to cover delegated legislation committees, public bill committees on primary legislation. They are going to be run ragged. Absolutely. I mean, do you think about it, more than half of the... Uh, putative 47 Lib Dem MPs in, in this admittedly somewhat improbable scenario w- would have to be shadow secretaries of state yeah. or chief whips or other jobs like that. So you've got a, a shadow cabinet of 22 members. doesn't really leave much space for anybody else in, 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 the, in the Lib Dems to do stuff. And if some of those are then taken up by, you know, as you say, chair of public accounts, chair of standards and privileges, chair of the backbench business committee, plus a couple of departmental committees on mm-hmm. the side, there won't be very many Lib Dem backbenchers. They'll be pretty rare creatures indeed. Meanwhile, you've got over 500 Labour MPs. What on earth will they all do all yeah, day? Yeah, Labour is going to have, be able to basically send 100 of them off for, for you know constituency weeks to nurture their, their local area one week every month. So whilst the opposition are completely out on their feet, Labour is sort of, you know, well, it's quite, quite relaxed. Yeah. Another point about these numbers, of course, is that you're talking about the Conservatives in this, as I say, somewhat improbable scenario, having half the number of Lib Dem MPs for twice the number of votes that the mm. Lib Dems got. So the Conservative share of around 20%, the Lib Dem share of 9%, but yet the Lib Dems have twice as many MPs. Now, I don't know if that will prompt a Damascene conversion to proportional representation <laughs> on the Conservative benches, or whether they'll just hope that come the next election after that, you know, the British politics will default back to its factory settings and they'll resume their natural place mm. in the order of things. But I suspect the Lib Dems will quite enjoy the moment and possibly take the view that if the Conservatives want to live by first past the post, and they're occasionally going to have to die by it. Mm. And you think about what it's going to mean for the Conservatives in the chamber. They'll be relegated in terms of Prime Minister's questions. They yeah. won't be at the dispatch box across from Keir Starmer. They'll be relegated in terms of selection of amendments. They won't get priority in terms of being oh. called in, in the debates. Yeah. And the other thing is, is money. So the opposition parties get what's called short money, which is sort of centrally government-provided money to, to support their operations. When you're down to these numbers you get very, very much reduced support. So at the moment, short money, you get about £21,000 for each seat. So if you've only got, um, you know, was it Conservatives have got 25 seats, that's a significant (laughs) reduction on what they might otherwise have expected going into opposition, if that's what happens. You get a top-up of £42 for every 200 voters. So they'll benefit more than the Liberal Democrats on that side if these, these poll numbers play out. But they won't get the million pounds that the office of the leader of the opposition gets. So presumably that's going to, to Ed Davey. But as you say, there's a kind of feels like an unfairness there that they're the official opposition, but they've only got half the share of the vote that the Conservatives get. But nonetheless, they get the million pounds. And whoever might be the Conservative Party leader, I mean, amongst whoever's left amongst this 25 MPs, they wouldn't get much support at all. Now, the psychological shock of that would be enormous. But as I say, I, I keep on harping on this. It's such an improbable scenario and such an overturning of the table that you wonder if it could possibly happen. But then you think on the fate of the Scottish Labour Party. Once totally dominant in Scotland, wiped out overnight in 2015. Recovering a little bit now. Recovering a little bit now. to the levels that they were. But where once the map of Scotland was pretty much all red, suddenly there was just Mm. one red dot left. Mm. And remember what happened to the Liberal Democrats again. Mm. Uh, once a, a substantial party with 50 MPs knocked down to a shadow of its former self again in 2015. So disaster can strike and the results can be pretty stunning because the electorate these days is much more willing to change its mind. Yeah, I mean, you've got to go back nearly 100 years, I think, probably to, to Baldwin's government when he, he got 560-odd MPs, I think. Um, there were only sort of 60 others This was the 1930s the national government. Yeah, that's the nearest comparison, really, in terms of the scale of what this poll suggests but I mean we're having a bit of a laugh about this and sort of amusing ourselves with what might happen but in terms of scrutiny of the government I'm not sure it would be a very good thing it would Um, be a terribly unbalanced system I mean the whole system rests on the idea that you have two large blocks Mm. facing one another able to kind of scrutinize each other and watch each other's every move and it just wouldn't be possible Mm. for a tiny number of opposition MPs to do a decent job 
mm. of scrutinising a government that, that was that dominant in the Chamber mm. of the Commons. Mm. I think it would also raise such sky-high expectations for Labour. <laughs> At one level on election night, it would be good sport, you know, they'll enjoy it, there'll be a degree of euphoria, but that could wear off pretty quickly when expectations are raised so high. And of course, in, in that scenario, you also have the prospect of there being hundreds of Labour MPs sloshing around with no substantive role, nothing to do on a select committee, nothing to do on a bill committee. They're just sort of there as voting fodder and being sent back to their constituencies a lot. And the devil will find work for idle hands. You, know, you could find that almost as a matter of occupational therapy, some of them become a bit rebellious. <laughs> Shall we move on then, Mark, from that bit of fun and um, back to the budget? <laughs> Well, to take a look at how the common system for measuring finance, keeping across it, looking at tax and spend compares to other countries, we're joined by Henry Midgley, Assistant Professor of Accounting at Durham University and Co-Director of the International Centre for Public Accountability. Henry, if Parliament were the board of a major company and went through its finances in the way that Parliament goes through it, they'd be in trouble, wouldn't they? They would. There are very few people on the parliamentary estate who actually have a good knowledge of finance and therefore can really advise MPs on what's happening with the numbers and what the numbers mean. And I just think there are often things that Parliament would want to know. For example, when Jeremy Hunt stood up and announced £3.5 billion for the NHS, IT systems or £26 billion for the National Theatre, will that money actually arrive? And will that money be deployed in the way that he said it would be deployed? We don't actually know that at the moment, and we won't know it even after a couple of years, because nowhere is that reported. Some other Westminster-style parliaments have introduced a parliamentary budget office to provide more support. We've got, in the Commons, a scrutiny unit, but it's limited in scale in terms of the number of staff and the, the amount of capacity they have. Is the parliamentary-style budget office, does that offer a solution? You're absolutely right on the scrutiny unit. When I worked on it, when I was on secondment there, it only had four or five members of staff covering the whole of government. And that's, with the best staff in the world, that's a very hard task. The second thing in terms of a parliamentary budget office is I think we need a clear idea of what that would do. Is it just advising MPs like the scrutiny unit does already? Now, when you look at the system that the Commons has at the moment, there, there is no way for MPs to say, hang on government, we'd like you to spend another five billion on, say, health and a five billion less on education to pay for it. That's something you'd see all the time in the US Congress, but in the Westminster model, that just doesn't happen. Absolutely. And one of the things about it is it is almost so unprecedented that we wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> so in, in the US situation, I mean, there are rules for how you shut down the US government. I remember trying to work out what would happen if you shut down the British government, if Parliament voted down the estimates. And it is very difficult to work out. There is a very obscure part of the Constitution called the controller function, which sits in the NAO, which is the thing which, um, if Parliament were to vote down the estimate, would block money coming from the Bank of England to then be distributed to departments. That power was last used in earnest in 1806. Wow. So we really have no idea what would happen if if MPs voted down an estimate and said, no, we don't want this. No, um, I think Dominic Grieve put up a potential amendment to an estimate in 2019 during the heart of the Brexit wars. And we sat around, I remember a number of us thinking, what will happen if Mr Grieve's motion actually succeeds? <laughs> Uh, I, I guess, in a way, since budgets are a matter of confidence, the government would fall, there'd probably be a general election. Exactly. I think that is the way. I think it's also important to distinguish between the budget, though Mr Hunt said a lot about spending yesterday, and the estimates. Because actually what the budget's doing mostly, in terms of legislation, is covering taxation. And then it's the estimates that sort of get slightly lost. There are three days of debate authorised by the Liaison Committee every year on the estimates. It's the estimates that authorise spending. So the budget, in a real way, isn't actually the budget. So this is a almost ritual process where there are estimates day debates, and they're usually focused on select committee reports on particular aspects of government spending. They don't look at the whole breadth of the estimates they're being invited to approve. It's just a, a rubber stamping exercise, really, isn't it? 
Absolutely. And it's an improvement on what used to happen before. Before, it was actually technically not in order to discuss expenditure in an estimates day debate. <laughs> as the so, SNP were very fond of pointing out. To go back to the budget, because obviously we've had the big announcement this week. And one of the concerns is that the Treasury Committee will look at this. It'll conduct a, a rapid fire scrutiny exercise before the government brings forward the finance bill. And there's a feeling that the Treasury Committee is overloaded, that we would be better to have a dedicated budget committee or some kind of taxation committee to look at these issues. Is there any benefit in that that you can see? I think with almost all the committees of the House, you can make an argument for overload. I, I, I could see a benefit in that. The Procedure Committee discussed it in a report in 2019 or 2018. I think the, the other side of that, though, is... You do have a limited number of backbenchers who are willing to perform scrutiny roles in the House and are willing to devote the time to it, particularly as we get closer to a general election. But equally, I think there's also a point about the other departmental select committees. They are supposed to be responsible for scrutinising the finance as well as the administration and policy of their departments. And in general, they don't. Every select committee under its core tasks, as you say, has this obligation to scrutinise departmental annual reports and accounts. Is there more that therefore they could be doing in terms of looking at the accounts? You do need committees to pay more attention to it. But the problem is, just as with the scrutiny unit, the staff support for the select committees here is quite limited. They will have four or five members of staff. They will have very few people who actually can read these documents. I think select committees in general are far too content with their lot. I would like to see them moan an awful lot more about what they are not getting. If you look at the estimates, I mean, they're pretty much unintelligible to anybody who's not an accountant. And it's fascinating to look at how they have changed because they've become much looser and much more vague over time. So if you go back to some of the 19th century ones, you can actually understand what they are say. And the education estimate in the 1880s says... These are how many schools we'll spend money on and these are how many pupils we will educate. You come to today and the categories, I agree with you, make much less sense to a lay person's eye. I'm a bit cynical about reforms that a government's invited to make that would make its own life more difficult. They always end up being kicked into touch. Unless <laughs> talking about in... the Hansard Society's raison d'etre, <laughs> well, It's a fair cop. Society's to blame. I mean, what can be done within the realm of, if you like, practical politics, something that a government might accept is worth doing? There are two things Parliament has. There's a lot of formal power that Parliament has, most of which it doesn't use because of the government's inbuilt majority in the House of Commons. Occasionally it does use it, and budgets have been changed for the Pamond on NI. But a ton of power comes to Parliament through purely its use of the bully pulpit. It's the fact it can go up and stand up and keep saying things. And slightly embarrass government into doing things. So we need to be much more assertive within Parliament and we need to follow up. When they make a promise, let's not let them off the hook. Henry Midgley, thanks very much indeed for joining us on the pod. Thank you very much. So that was Henry Midgley on how the House of Commons manages the purse strings. And meanwhile, Ruth, the exodus continues. Another fairly substantial Conservative MP has announced that he will leave the Commons when the next election comes, and that's Paul Scully. He's been a middle-ranking minister for quite a long period, having won his seat back in 2015 off the Lib Dems in Sutton and Cheam. He's announced essentially that he's had enough, and he did so in a long Twitter stream that went through some of the problems, privations and disappointments of political life. His Twitter thread was really interesting because it brought into focus a a number of things. I mean, one, the the incredible pressures that MPs are under and the way in which life as a parliamentarian, life at Westminster, splitting your life between London and the constituency, how that can have a real impact, not just on you, but on your family and, and friends. And he talks about the last nine years that he's been an MP having been an incredible roller coaster. He feels like he's achieved a lot. And he talks about, you know, he's been acknowledged as, as a minister who led the way on the post office, actually, he was one of the first ministers to really get start to get to grips with that horizon scandal. And he talks about other issues, you know, working on some international issues. But he also notes that he's lost his marriage 
And he's also lost two colleagues, of course, Joe Cox and, and David Amos, murdered during his time in Parliament. And he talks about the time has come to pass the baton on. But he also has some pretty strong, robust advice to his Conservative Party colleagues, suggesting that they really need to get to grips in the next Parliament um, with their direction of travel. It's worth quoting some of this a bit more. Fueled by division, the party, that is the Conservative Party, has lost its way and needs to get a clear focus, which I hope the budget can start to provide. It needs a vision beyond crisis management, which can appeal to a wider section of the electorate, including younger people. Then he goes on, if we just focus on the core vote, eventually that core shrinks to nothing. Talk about housing, renting first because home ownership has drifted too far away from many. Show a real connection and empathy with other generations. Otherwise, we risk pushing ourselves into an ideological cul-de-sac. And he adds, uh, and this is quite a fun piece of language which may enter the political lexicon, the standard deviation model is true in politics. Most people are in the middle. We can work with the bell curve or become the bell ends. We need to make that decision. I fear the electorate already has. Now, that's not language that often crops up in a family podcast, but it was quite a, quite an effective way of summing up where he fears his party's going. It's worth saying, I think, that um, although the numbers of retirements, essentially, from Parliament are not yet at the scale that we've seen in some past elections, they're heading in that direction. And there's sort of suggestion that Conservative Central Office has asked MPs to space out their announcements so that they're not all... Coming together it looked like a stampede yeah basically. yeah for the for the doors there is just this sense of an awful lot of middle ranking ballast in the conservative party saying that enough is enough and part of that is the horrors of parliamentary life the divorce rate amongst mps especially the two or three years after they come into parliament when people settle down to the rhythms of parliamentary life they suddenly discover it's, it can be pretty hard on families we've done research on the experience of new mps in that first year as they sort of transition from being a member of the public to being a member of parliament and we did it in sort of 2005, 2010, 2015. And what comes through is how actually how lonely they find those first early months when they land in Parliament. It's such a, a, a different and alien atmosphere in many respects. And actually, we you know surveyed what were they looking forward to? You know, a few months in, and a number of them said finishing <laughs> Christmas. And it, you kind of sort of feel it's a, it's a bit depressing, really, that you know landing up in our national Parliament, they arrive ready, eager, enthusiastic, glowing with the, the light of duty in their eyes. Yeah, and then actually it dissipates quite quickly and it becomes quite stressful. And though that, you know, that research was done before all the more recent pressures and threats and social media is much more uh, plays a much bigger role in their their working lives than it than it did when we were doing the research. So things have got more intense and they've got more difficult. So I think that is something that the political parties are going to have to think about quite hard in the next parliament is how particularly if, if you know if you talk about Labour having a very significant mm. intake supporting them helping them manage their way through those early months and, and that's certainly something at the society that be working on in the new parliament. It's not so much a, a matter of them needing intensive whipping because the, potentially there's going to be a vast Labour majority. Mm. It's more a case of needing a kind of HR department yep. that provides them with the support, the training and maybe just the sympathetic ears that they will occasionally yeah. need. And that is something that the Hansar Society is, is poised to assist with because we, we are, um, we've got some funding from the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust and we're going to help with training professional development in areas like how to understand the legislative process, how to read a bill, how to understand the budgets and estimates processes that we've been talking on, on, on today's episode about. So uh, we stand ready to, uh, to help. <laughs> and that, I think, Ruth, is probably a good moment to stop. Yeah, we'll see you next week. See you then. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Oh, what do I know about <laughs> algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> Well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Hansard Society.
Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Hansard Society.